Hello, and welcome to the Wade Borth Podcast. I'm your host, Wade Borth. And in every episode, my goal is to get you to think differently about how money works and ultimately to empower you to take control of your money and your personal financing system. Well, welcome back, Nicole. I want to take one last chapter that Nelson puts in his book, and it's called Points to Consider. So again, thank you for joining me today on the podcast where we've gone through Nelson's book. We've laid out our thoughts, our feelings about a lot of the different chapters. But I always say if you had to read, if you, if you had 10 minutes and you had to read four pages, I would say read the introduction, to the fourth chapter of the book. That's the very first pages of the book. And then go back to the very last page and a half, or really the last page, because that's kind of like cliff notes for the person that doesn't want to take the time to read 85 pages of Nelson's book, very deep, 85 pages. But if you don't want to take the time to read 85 pages, read the introduction, fourth edition, and then read pages three and four and go to the very end, read page 85, because that kind of, again, gives you the cliff notes. It doesn't give you the details. It doesn't give you the meat of it, but it gives you the, you can hear the sizzle and you can smell the steak cooking uh, with these three or four pages. This is where Nelson comes back and he summarizes really what he was saying or, or what he wanted to get across in the book. And in you know, the very first point he makes, he goes, there's only two sources of income, people at work and money at work. So let's think about that for one quick sec, Nicole. Do you want to work? You know, I, I plan to work for the rest of my life because I love what I do. Am I going to work as hard or many hours or with the same amount of enthusiasm? I hope so, but reality tells me that's probably not going to happen. I might have other dreams. I might have other aspirations about teaching and doing some other things with the youth. That I'm going to take time away from doing what I'm doing, but I'm still going to be doing. So then I have to have money at work to make that happen. And that's really what we're talking about. So the question is how do we find those dollars of work, right? And then not becoming a consumer mindset of saying, oh, we want to consume this money, but let's have an asset that's going to generate cash flow for us on a daily or monthly basis so we don't have to consume our asset. Because that's the problem with 401ks, is that they make you save, they make you sacrifice to build up this bucket of money. And then the only way to make that happen is that you have to consume that bucket of money from the time you retire until the time you die. And if you have an asset, you're miserable every day because the price of that, the, the volatility of that bucket, if it's in the market, is going up and down every day, right? You don't know if you have enough money to make the next 30 years. No. If everything worked out exactly the way the financial planner said, yeah, then you have no problem making it 30 years. But what if it doesn't work out? What if we have a downturn in the economy? What if we have the markets that go backwards for two or three years? You know, are we going to make, you're going to have a lot of anxiety around that. And so you think about it, if we can, Bring this to the next generation, because that's, again, one of my founding principles, right? Is I want this, make this generational into the future generation. Do I want my son working to grow somebody else's capital in somebody else's bank and somebody else's business? Absolutely not. I want him to understand, to take control of it so that when he's using money, it's growing his book. It's growing his capital. Don't grow other people's wealth. Grow your wealth. You owe it to yourself and your family to get him on that thought process, because Again, it's money at work or people at work. Well, if it's going to be you physically working to grow somebody else's cash flow, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So yeah, to that point, it's got to pass through somebody's hands for the banking function to work. Why isn't your hand? Why don't you, and the question, it's an honest question. Why are we doing it? It's because we've never been taught or even thought that we could. We haven't used our imagination that it has to pass through somebody's hands. It has to pass through somebody's bank. So why not have it pass through our own? Again, we're going to start with ourselves and then we're going to eventually say, Hey, I know other people that need access to cash. I have capital. You need cash. Let's pass it through my family banking system. And then now we're taking control of that banking system. So it, it's a great point is that it has to go through somebody else. It has to go through the, so somebody's hands. Let's make it our hands to make it go through. So I'm going to go back up to number two. You know, the second point that he makes is that if you knew at passive income time, that's his speak for retirement, that you would be getting everything back to paid into the system tax-free, would you object to putting more money into it? Think about that. You're like guaranteed you're going to get more money out than you put into it and you can get it on a tax-free basis. You know, the question is how big do you want that bucket of money to be? You're going to draw out more money than you ever put into it. And at the same time, there's going to be a death benefit that goes to your spouse, children, legacy, whatever it is. So here's the condition thinking that people have been under is that premium for life insurance is the problem. And if we understand what's really going on, and Nelson said that many times in the book, if we know what's going on, we'll know what to do. 
premiums aren't the problem. They're actually the, because we just need to build a bigger bucket of money. Yeah, I love number four. When government creates a problem, calls it onerous taxation, and then turns around and grants you an exception to that problem, tax qualified plans, aren't you just a little bit suspicious that you're being manipulated? Boy, how it is not the truth in today's environment. You know, and that, this is what I find people voluntarily enter into a contract with the government that they don't trust. You talk to anybody. Do you trust the government? Oh, yeah. You put money in the 401k? Oh, yeah. All kinds of money in the 401k. Well, you just entered into a contract with the government that you don't trust. And rightfully so. You shouldn't trust your government. You should always question what they're doing. Yeah. Because, again, it's not their money. So you've entered into a contract with them. But you're doing it voluntarily. They're not forcing you to put money in the 401k. They just have conditioned you to think that's where you need to put your money. Because they don't want you to control the banking function in your life. But... You know, if that's where you want to go with it, that's fine. I'm, you know, but don't complain when the government changes the rules down the road. Because again, it's their playing field. It's their ball and it's their goalpost. They can change all those that they want. And you voluntarily stepped onto that playing field. So all the advice I would give to you is don't. That's crazy. Just again, what people voluntarily do, un but this unknowingly, quite frankly, just because they're having yeah. an education around, what does it really mean to do that? And so. I always say, you know, the first time somebody mentions this to you and you're like, oh, I didn't know. Well, that, that's forgivable. But the second time you already know about it and then you complain about it, then you really have no, no leg to stand on to complain. It's like you're knowingly doing, getting a contract with the government and they're changing their rules. And if you don't like it, why were you there in the first place? So then the next point, your wealth has to reside somewhere. Where would you prefer to reside? This is a great question from Nelson's standpoint. Because we talk a lot about real estate, but real estate has a lot of, you know, a lot of you know, pitfalls that you have to understand is that in order to get money out of real estate, you either have to come in the form of the cash flow from rental or the sale, or you have to be able to finance it. Well, all three of those are dependent on somebody else. I'm a, I love real estate. Don't get me wrong. It's just that it doesn't have the liquidity everybody thinks it has. It has liquidity when somebody's willing to give you a loan against it. But if they're not willing to give you a loan against it, then what? Then what do you go with it? That's a bit different. It's an investment, so you have the possibility of loss, but it probably is one of the best assets to give your cash flow on a long-term basis. But again, it, there's no guarantees that's going to happen. Where your policy has the only place that you can put your money that has guarantees. So all we're talking about <laughs> leveraging your cash, your policy cash value is to make that happen. But then we talk about, you know, do you want to put it in the stock market? I don't really need to speak much about that. Because if people understand what's going on in the stock market, they would run like crazy from it. You know, what was it? Uh, the guy, John Bogle, I think he says, what people should know about the stock market is don't do it, right? He's, and basically, I think he was giving advice. He's like, the average person should not be in the stock market. This is the guy that started Fidelity Funds or Vanguard or whatever he started. But the point was, the advice you have is that's a manipulated market by those that have real money. Huge money. And they manipulate where the price goes. And so we're always going to be reactive, no matter how great we think we are, how smart we are, we're always having to react to the market. So if that's where you want to grow and you think you can grow wealth there, then, you know, more power to you. But that doesn't stop you from having a bucket of money that you can use for bank. Again, take advantage of opportunities. I've done this in the past. I've had, you know, opportunities come along where the market goes down 30% in two or three weeks. I take a policy loan and I go buy some stocks that I really want to own. I want some companies that I really want to own because they pay good dividends or a good company, whatever it might be. And I go buy them at the time when everybody else is having to sell. It's about taking advantage of chaos. When there's chaos in the streets, you know, I'm buying when everybody's selling. And then when the price went back up and everybody's buying, I turn on, I sold my payoff a policy loan. And I got a dividend in the meantime. How fabulous is that? Not that I'm against the stock market. I'm against blindly saying the stock market is the way that you're going to make your wealth in this world. I'm just, I just I'm not convinced that's always going to happen. Well, again, we're just on question number five. It says, wealth has to reside somewhere. Where would you prefer it reside? And the last point he makes, he says, or would you rather have it be in a free contract with other free, like-minded people, which is a life insurance policy. On the base of a financial operation, you can do any of the things in life that you desire. So let's, re let's think about that for a second. You're entering into a contract with other free people that are like-minded. And that's what life insurance is, right? The voluntary contract with other people that think the same way you think. Who would you rather hang out with? People you like and people that have the same values or people that don't? All right. So no, point number six, you finance everything you buy. You either pay up interest to someone else or you give up interest you could have earned elsewhere. If you 
get nothing else out of this chapter or the book, get that point. You either pay up interest or you give up interest. If you don't, if you can't get that, and you don't understand that, and you've read, you read the book and you re listen to the podcast and you still don't get that, then you're probably somebody that we can't do business with because that's the founding principle of what we're talking about. And now, as interest rates rise, that argument, well, I can go and, you know, finance somewhere else cheaper. Now, as interest rates rise, <clears throat> are rising, is that could be the case. Again, all we're doing is there's a big pool of money. And your contract gives you contractual guarantees to that big pool of money up to the equity that you have in your policy. When I say equity that you have in your policy, that's the cash value that you have in your policy. If you have access to that big pool of money that all the big banks and all the big money exchanges and all the big real estate developers want, and this gives you access to that money, guaranteed, contractual guaranteed access to that money. Nobody else is giving you that guaranteed access to that big pool of money except for your life insurance card, to your point. And again, it's again, you're paying interest to somebody. So why not be your own organization, your own business? I heard somebody say, oh, six and a half percent interest is awful. I said, unless you're the bank, if you're so outraged about having to pay a high interest rate on something, then stop being outraged, change your environment, right? That's Nelson's point was, if you don't like the environment you're in, change the environment. Yeah. Everybody wants to be outraged at the environment they're in and they don't want to change the environment. So the last point, and we'll let you go with this, is that your need for financing during your lifetime exceeds your need for life insurance protection. This is probably the biggest, you know, again, Nelson talked about misclassification. People don't understand what a life insurance policy is. You know, it's a professionally managed bond portfolio done at an institutional level for the benefit of you or me. Guaranteed never to go backwards with the predetermined exit strategy if you die or if you want to get out. That's your cash value, your death benefits. All those are predetermined. And so is life insurance important? Yeah, but it's way more than just the death benefit. Quite frankly, that's just a part of it. It can actually be a small part of it. And if we're doing it correctly, our IBC policies properly designed will way out produce a death benefit in the later years when we start looking at how much death benefit is going to be provided. So again, and it's not about the product, but the product you need to have an understanding of the product and their need for financing is going to be way out seeds their need for life insurance protection. Again, that's a different conversation with life insurance protection, but understand what a whole life policy is just a bucket of money that's managed for our benefit by professionals down at the institutional level. So we get all the benefits with what downside, what downside do we have? We don't, people say, oh, we don't get to use our money, but you do get to use your money. You do get you guaranteed access to a policy loan. If you have an app, if you have an opportunity, you have guaranteed access to a policy model. That's fabulous, right? If you die, death benefit. What's the downside? The downside is that you have to think for yourself. You have to think long term, and that's the downside. And so people think there's all sorts of gimmicks and life insurance expensive a gimmick or whatever it is. It's like it's been around for 250 years. This industry has been around for 250 years, and it's been we've been conditioned to think how awful life insurance is because the big Wall Street money players don't want you putting your money there. Put out ads. They hire TV entertainers like Suzy Orban the Moron and Dave the Dipstick to tell you that this is terrible putting your money in. Well, don't listen to them. Look at people that have real money. Look at the Rockefellers. Look at Wells Fargo. Look at Bank of America. Don't listen to anybody that's on a podcast or you know, Dave or anybody. Else. Look at what people that have real wealth. Look at what they're doing. If it's in the this makes you think, doesn't it? Well, I mean, one thing, but the people that have real power and real money, they're doing something different. Yeah, benefit. It's, it's hard to quantify that for people that don't understand, that aren't willing to have a little bit of imagination, say, ask and question and say, again, it, and I heard a guy say, well, you know, this life insurance policy was just a base only policy. And it was, it's still a great policy. It just, it's a longer term venture. And it's just like buying a mortgage in a house. Buying a house, people say, oh, it's a terrible place to put your money. Well, you got to live somewhere. You know, buying a house is not a bad place to put your money. You need to live somewhere. You got to put your stuff somewhere. You got to, you know, find a community somewhere. So why not buy a house and start that? But if you buy a policy just to, you know, with this guy was calling it a crappy old life policy. I'm like, crappy old life. I said, there's no such thing as a crappy old life. Some is designed for death benefit and some is designed to accumulate cash early. But at the point, at the end of the day, they're, they're all great have all a little bit different benefits when you design them differently. But at the end of the day, all you try to do, and this is what Nelson, people have to understand, that's all Nelson did. He bought policies back in 1954 
when they didn't have PUA riders, and they just bought a traditional whole life policy from his brother. And he was mad at his brother. He said, probably after arguing with him right now, that he didn't sell him a big enough policy. That was his biggest complaint with his brother, is that he didn't have the ability to think bigger than he did. And it convinced him to think bigger than Nelson thought he should have thought back in 1954. So the point is, you know, it's just a great place. It's a long-term thought process that a lot of people don't want to go down that path. And quite frankly, you know, if you're not willing to think past, you know, you know, three or four days from now, you now have a long-term process. Again, probably won't be a client of ours because we're thinking long-term. And quite frankly, when I'm talking long-term, like Nelson talked, he was a forester by trade. So he thought 80 years was an average time frame. I'm thinking generations. How can we get people out of bondage from these financial institutions? It's about a long-term desire to get people to think differently, to give them the tool, give them the ability, along with the knowledge, because money without knowledge will be money no more in your pocket because it'll quickly go. That's what people don't understand. And that's what's happening is we have to build this for the generations, right? Three, four, five, ten generations. That's the change. That's the impact I want to have, the long-term impact by getting people to think. And then somebody has to start. Somebody has to have the gumption and the guts and the understanding and the knowledge and the wisdom and all the things it's going to take to take their family and say, we're not going to do this anymore. We're going to do something better for our family and the multiple generations that are coming behind. And that's the person that's here. Somebody has to start it. And, and so today, you know, the listener out there, be the one that starts it. You know, does it have to be all done perfectly immediately right away? Absolutely not. Hardest part, hardest part is that first step. Take the first step, have a conversation, start your first policy. And then if the, if the person says you're going to have multiple policies over a lifetime, if they don't say that, run away. If they're not IBC practitioners, run away because they don't know what they're talking about. Well, they may even know what they're talking about, but quite frankly, find somebody that knows and has policies and doing them themselves because you don't know what you don't know until you find out you don't know it, right? Yeah. I would love for you to contact us, you know, you know, or Nicole or there's somebody that is that's certified that's working, just has an understanding and has a history of, here's what I'm doing with my policy. Haven't shown me your policies. I got my policy. They got policy loans on them. We're doing a lot of different things. What are we doing? Are they practicing what they preach? And it, it has to be somebody that's engaged in this process. All I encourage you to do is read Nelson's book, listen to podcasts, educate yourself, and then get started. Move forward because all this is great information. Unless, you know, it's all, it's all great information, but it means nothing unless you take action. So again, it's all great information, all good stuff, unless you take no action. So you have to get out there and take action after you've educated yourself, after you bring yourself to the process. Well, again, thank you, Nicole. I appreciate your time. I know I monopolized the conversation, but that's just, I, have, I feel like I have a lot to say and short of time to say it. So. I will say that as you begin to get into this, and this is exactly what this really is and what it can really do and how it can really help people control their money and control what's happening in their lives by financial aspects get work happen. and get really excited about it because there is just so much there's just so much here and so much opportunity and then and just the thought just the imagination of you know just taking a step back close your eyes and say you know i, I had one client do this he says i want my family to look back over a hundred years and say, that's the guy that started or That's the woman that started us, our family down this path to financial freedom. And he says, I want them to point to my picture of me because I've taken the opportunity. And it was like, it's almost sounds like he's writing, but he's not. He's like, that's his dream. And that's his desire to lift his whole family. His kids that aren't born yet. And his grandkids, children that aren't born yet. And great grandchildren are born yet. Lifting them all out of the servitude to the banks for the, this common thinking process. And he says, I want to be the person that takes us to that next level. Yeah. And you know, Wade, I think as I have gotten to know more people in the community, I think that's something that drives us as practitioners that maybe we don't talk about enough. I know for me personally, to be able to help people break out of this bondage and truly be able to, you know, we hear lots about being financially independent or financially free, and there's lots of stuff around that you can look up. But so go, going back to people like Susie and Dave, they don't really teach people how to be financially free. And no. if you can, if I can help people become truly financially independent, financially free, then I know that their lives are going to be 
better. And they can then begin to teach that to other members of their family. And we can make a difference. We can make an impact. Yeah. It's not just about, uh, you know, just this is a cool idea and it really, you know, it works. Truly making this world, helping people reach their potential. 100% agree. It is such a passion to get people to be their highest form of themselves and then get everybody that, you know, all the other generations to to do that as well. I think about it, if we could, you know, teach people and empower people, then the conversation two generations from now is, it's going to be a completely different conversation. It's not going to be revolving around, oh, 6% interest, terrible, blah, blah, blah. It's going to be like, you know, they're going to be thinking and talking about big ideas versus talking about events. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. It changes their perspective. And it's hard for you to explain that until you start seeing it happen. It's like, when you have, when you start having different conversations with kids and they're using their policy and they make their first policy loan and paying it back and they're getting this, the conversation, they can never go and unlearn that. Right. Just like Nelson, by default, we could win, we could win this money game. Just by default, if we just took Nelson's book and applied 20% of it, we're going to win by default. Yeah. Think how great it can be if we can apply 80%. Yeah. And then have them set and work with somebody. Don't be afraid to work with, you know, the best athletes and the highest level athletes get there, not by being great athletes, it's by working with elite level coaching. That's the part that I think a lot of people are scared of. It's like, oh, somebody might make some money after. Well, fabulous. Anyhow. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Appreciate you, Nicole. And I just encourage people to read the book, reach out to us and start a conversation again. Thank you so much for your time. If you're enjoying this podcast or know anyone else that might be interested, please be sure to hit the subscribe button and please leave a review. This will help this podcast reach and help more people by ranking higher in searches and ultimately help more people get out of financial bondage. And don't be afraid to share this podcast with your friends and family. We can be easily found on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. 